All righty. Cyber threat intel or threat intelligence, it's a pretty popular topic out there, very well known in information security circles, but from a general perspective, it's probably considered more of something that someone has looked at if they had military experience or a military background. I was actually in the Air Force and in a threat intelligence position in my late teens and early 20s. I was actually a uh, imagery analyst looking at uh, satellite. And once uh, Predator drones came along, we actually got some video out of there. So I was actually doing this back in the day when it was just more of a military function. And now that it's kind of moved into security and information security has been a thing. CTI has become a portion of that. Essentially, the um, intelligence intelligence and the looking at intel out of attacks and uh, advanced persistent threat groups or APT groups as they're called are attack groups that are well sponsored and well paid for out of countries. A uh, big ones right now, if you have not heard, are China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran are the four countries that sponsor the majority of the criminal threat groups that are out there that have interests in attacking um, United States and Western governments and that type of thing. So essentially, we're going to look at cyber threat intel, uh, a quick view into how risk plays into that. And then essentially, the easiest way to break CTI down and the easiest way to explain it and the way that I write a lot of my CTI notifications and flash briefs, if you've seen any of those on our Twitter page, on our Medium account, or things that I've shared internally, our weekly breakdown of news, that type of thing. It's essentially done in a method that's essentially a what, so what, and now what. So they're kind of the three easy steps to, to break down looking at any news story. But in our instance, it works great for cyber threat intel and a great way to explain essentially what I'm looking for and what I'm doing with that. And real quick, just from the slide perspective, I just wanted to break down uh, what CTI is for a couple slides, and we're going to talk about intelligence to risk. This is kind of a new thing for CTI. It is a look at using threat intelligence, and you'll see what's called strategic threat intelligence to share more upwards with the executive team and the board and company leadership, and how that's kind of how that kind of works in just a basic way, and then the what so what and now what method I went through. So for an introduction, this is essentially what I use on LinkedIn is my description. So this is what the cyber threat intel practice does. We essentially provide threat intelligence for our customers. That includes my monitoring threat intel on a daily basis, sharing with all of us internally if it applies, things such as uh, Apple security updates, that type of thing or gathering information that I present to our customers. Each one of our customers gets a monthly briefing at that over the long term and keep an eye out for activity that may impact customers that is not something that's a problem in the past or currently, but that could be in the future. So there are a lot of threat groups out there. Uh, North Korea's threat groups are more financially focused because of all the sanctions on the country. So a lot of the North Korean activity you will see is cryptocurrency focused because they're trying to get funds to support not only the further criminal activity, but just general support of the country in general versus China, who has been sponsoring this since the early to mid 2000s and uh, kind of ran wild for many years until Obama met with President Z, I believe in 2010 or 2011 and had a conversation about advanced APT group activity and, and hacking against the United States. They were essentially looking for intellectual property. So there was attacks that were attributed to China for years and it has ramped up again now recently where they're essentially breaking into not for financial services or to businesses to steal money, but to turn around and steal intellectual property. So research organizations, United States universities, government related organizations that would turn around and provide them with intellectual property, do things like build new military equipment, turn around and build new research. A lot of that was helping to support the fact that China was kind of a third world country for a long time and then essentially is considered first world with all the development and everything they've done a lot of that is based on research that they have that has been essentially attributed to them that's been stolen from western organizations western research organizations that type of thing and then essentially why is threat intel important so essentially to the first bullet point we're shedding light on the unknown. So uh, security teams, it's kind of a, there's known knowns and then there's unknown unknowns and the unknown unknowns are the big problem. So when you look at threat intel and you're looking at actor activity, you're looking at malicious actors, you're looking at malware, you're looking at ransomware, 
phishing, business email compromise, that type of thing, not being aware of those things makes it extremely hard for a security team to figure out what it is they need to protect. So essentially, the idea when you look at a new organization, if you are building a new security team, is you want to look at what's called the crown jewels. So essentially, the the major systems, the major developments, the, the intellectual property, you know, a bank, it would be the financial transfer systems for um, so the primary things you want to protect. And those are the things you want to be aware of not only from past activity, but current activity and future activity on that unknown attacker. So if there is a new major APT group or threat group that is coming out of another country, that would be a threat. You would want to be aware of that so that you could turn around and respond to that, whether that would mean maturing systems, adding new systems, or just being aware of, hey, this company has, or this APT group is now focused on our company. We need to be more proactive. We need to look for these things. We need to be better prepared for advanced, mature phishing messages. You know, you you used to have phishing messages that would come across that would be very poorly done. They would be written in, in broken English and hard to read and that type of thing. And now with the maturity of systems and the maturity of these attacker groups, you're getting phishing messages and malware and things like that in very complex ways and not being aware of how that works and how how attackers are doing that would leave organizations that we would be tasked to protect and or if you work for your own organization, leaving that organization, you know, high and dry and not aware of, of, of the changing nature and the maturity of attacks. So it essentially empowers those security stakeholders by revealing adversarial motives. And then a big thing that we look at in threat intelligence are called tactics, techniques, and procedures, uh, which we refer to with a thousand acronyms as TTPs. Those are essentially the base level things that attackers are doing. So you would look at their activity, their general behavior. You can see that from the strategic level and see these attacks. And then when you look down at the operational level, that's where you're getting into tactics, techniques, and procedures. So there are organizations out there our government has several of them that work on security. One of them is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, and they work with a research organization as well called MITRE, and that company has developed essentially a database that tracks these TTPs across threat actors, so you can go out and map an attack by a specific threat actor into the things that they do and the way that they do them. So you try and correlate this, this threat actor would essentially do these things in this order. So they, they would fish financial organizations, they would then get access to people's accounts, they would then steal passwords and try and get as many accounts as possible then they would get involved and download malware. Or this other group just sends out phishing messages with Word documents attached. And in those Word documents is a link. The person clicks on the phishing message. There's nothing bad in the message itself. They open up the Word document and inside the Word document is either a macro that Windows is now disabled from running automatically to prevent this type of thing from happening or a link to an external website that's a fishy bad website that when they click on it would download some piece of ransomware, malware, spyware, whatever it happens to be. So those different behaviors from the different groups are what we refer to as TTPs. And it allows you to see over a span of weeks, months, years, these specific groups and the behaviors that they do and when they change activity, trying to track that in some formalized way so that it isn't just, oh, there's a whole bad list of bad guys and here's all the thousand things they can do. It's a way to look at and say, again, if I'm a financial services company, these are the APT groups and these are the things that they do. If I'm a government organization, these are the things that the attackers do. They're at this maturity level. We need to make sure we have all these specific systems in place from a security perspective. And essentially to that, that third bullet point, it helps security professionals understand their decision-making process, their change, and then business stakeholders, especially um, when you think about this, there is the security team and having to be prepared, but the whole point in that security team is to protect those organizations and those organizations from risk. And the risk is what the executive boards, CISOs, CIOs, and CTOs are going to look at, right? They need to look at the the budget for the security team over the year or the budget for us serving as their MSSP as their security and the benefit they need to produce out of that or the benefit they want to get out of that aligns more with risk and mitigating risk. They aren't looking at it as, oh, there's these bad APT actors out there that are threatening us or, or you know, this phishing thing needs to be there or multi-factor authentication. They're not thinking at that level. They're thinking at the risk level and that the risk over time. And so essentially threat intel needs to provide 
information at that level all the way up the chain if possible so that executives and people at those decision-making points at all companies can then be efficient and make faster decisions, not only on budgets, but on responses. So when a ransomware act action happens and a security incident happens, if it was ransomware, they need to have, the security team needs to have an incident response plan. So they need to have a plan to say, okay, an event happened, it's actually become an incident. We need to have a response to this. That's handled at the technical level. But from the risk perspective and the external communication level, that's where CISOs and CIOs will be involved and the executive board and things like that will be involved from a risk perspective and being aware of if a ransomware event happened, how would we respond? What would it cost? What would our impact to the business be? That type of thing. And then, as I stated, the three types of cyber threat intelligence. So tactical is at the bottom. Uh, tactical would be the, what's considered the most basic threat intelligence. Tactical is really usually automated. These are things like, as I mentioned, CrowdStrike earlier. This is actually a slide from, from their presentation. This would be their systems sending out very basic information. So this would be, hey, we saw this machine. This machine got impacted with ransomware. Here's the machine name. Here's the IP address. Here is a hash or a mathematical compute of the executable that you can track here is things like that. So those are usually automated. The focus would be on malware analysis. So malware, ransomware, that type of thing, breaking those down into these very basic indicators. The people involved in that would usually be more tools than stakeholders. So yes, as this slide says, a SOC analyst or the SOC team would be interested from the tactical level, but it's usually things that are being automated and fed through API calls and things like that into your other tools. So your security incident and event management tool, your SIM, firewalls, your endpoints, your intrusion detection system usually tied in with SIM and firewall and those type of things. The middle one would be operational. So operational would be those tactics, techniques, and procedures. Um, as noted here in the slide, that's really going to be the SOC analysts are interested from an incident response perspective. A threat hunter is usually a lot of the times done in alignment with threat intelligence, but also the SOC. So threat hunting would essentially be, hey, we are aware of either a this activity happened, this ransomware activity happened. Here's the here's the tactical information of how to find those things, but someone wants to go out and actually look within the tools. So threat hunting would be, hey, I have these hashes or I have these things. They're built into the tools and the detection is, but we also want to look at multiple things together. So we want to go out and proactively look in our environment if this piece of ransomware has ever been discovered anywhere, do we have any indications, even if it happened to have been caught by our endpoint protection tool or our SIM or things like that, we want to look for this activity to make sure we're not seeing anything whatsoever that would tie to that. And then strategic is a lot of what I'm doing for our customers, like in those monthly reports and that daily monitoring. The strategic level is the high level trends, adversarial motives, the APT activity, or just regular criminal groups. Um, there's plenty of groups that are out there that aren't APT aligned specifically, but they're doing criminal activity. So there's a lot of threat groups, a lot of ransomware groups. A lot of those are tied to government sponsored organizations. But a lot of those are also just criminal groups looking to make money, looking to hoard money, looking, you know, especially in areas like Eastern Bloc, the, you know, Eastern Europe, Russia, things like that. Russia does not tend to crack down on cybercrime if it's perpetrated on citizens outside of Russia or outside of some of those countries. So Russia has a long history of not having a problem or not prosecuting activity as long as it isn't against Russian citizens. So you have a lot of the phishing groups and a lot of groups like that that make money off these things that are based in countries like Russia, where Russia itself isn't taking action against them. So then you have like this 19 year old kid on Instagram taking photos in front of his Ferrari because he's stolen all this money from people and gotten all this cryptocurrency and then they aren't smart and tend to travel to countries and get arrested by western governments and things like that so but that's essentially the strategic point where we're looking at the CISO, CIO, CTO and the strategic intel threat sharing and then this is the part where essentially we translate it to risk so this is kind of a newer perspective with threat intel recorded future is a major security company out there a very well-known one in the industry and this is kind of their take as they're maturing their threat intelligence and maturing the threat intelligence process they are looking at translating strategic threat intelligence to risk so essentially this is the look at how threat intelligence which has you know traditionally in the past, 
been looked at as something that would provide those tactical and operational levels, but that there needs to be maturity on the strategic point and sharing that information and being aware and tracking things over time so that risk can be presented up to the board. So it's a way to elevate threat intelligence from more of a inside the information security team only, internal sharing only, that type of thing, to again, sharing with those levels. So one of the benefits that I feel we have greatly with our customers is that monthly um, presentation that I present to them where I tend to present them anywhere from 10 to 15 different things and a breakdown of why those happen on top of all the CTI notifications and um, CTI flash briefs and things we do throughout the month. I uh, Those may potentially be part of it, but usually it's things and events that have happened throughout the month that aren't at that level, but that our, um, our customers need to be aware of as a response factor so it would be something they could use to be aware of general phishing it's a new apt activity that type of thing and this translating it to risk and getting it between as as noted to distinguish between actual threats and potential risks so that organizations can make those decisions and then an advantage is also to identify and classify challenges and using threat intel to look at those challenges and look at business challenges. So the at the end of the day, businesses make money based on their general process, what makes them special, their secret sauce, and how to protect that and how to be aware of the threats and activity that's out there at the same time is, is extremely important. And then this was um, the guys that came up with the intelligence to risk framework. They essentially created a pyramid. So um, it just serves as a really good chart to look at intelligence um, and all the way up to risk. So you've got intel there at the bottom of the pyramid. Again, more of those tactical and operational pieces where you're looking at events, patterns, anomalies to those patterns, that type of thing, and then translating it up that way into the implications of the threat, um, validating controls that are already in place. So most organizations now, I would hope in 2023, have some level of IT and security control systems um, from basic things like multi-factor authentication on all their external systems to the SIMs and the endpoint protection tools and things like that, but to actually validate that those systems work against those threats. So that is kind of how that translates almost into that threat hunting and proactive threat intel. And then looking at translating that up to recommendations into full on risk and the upside and downside risk and action from uh, the executive team. And then a good way to break the strategic Cyber threat intel down is, again, this process. Uh, it seems very basic, and it is very basic, but I think it's a good way to break down in a very simple way essentially any event that happens out there, you know, between what's announced on Twitter that I follow on a thousand different security blogs and, and newsletters and things like that, and all the information that I look at on a daily basis, you need to be able to quickly triage or break that information down and figure out what's important. Why is it important? And what are we going to do about it? And that's essentially this process. So the what? These are the events. So I pulled a couple events yesterday. This was news that just happened to come out in the last couple of days. And I wanted to just use these as an example. So from the what? Okay, this is just generally what happened. So we have an issue where there was an IT employee that was actually impersonating a ransomware gang to extort their employer. I believe this happened almost Two years ago now, the actual event and prosecution has taken a while, but there's actually a gentleman from the United Kingdom that was arrested for doing this. Um, he was actually one of their IT staff that then impersonated the attacker group to try and extort his company for money. So as, as the IT support staff, he claimed a ransomware event happened, and then he impersonated the ransomware gang when this activity never happened to essentially extort his employer for money because he wasn't happy. So he was actually convicted of unauthorized computer access, which in the United States is a felony. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly how the UK classifies unauthorized computer access, but then they nailed him with criminal intent and blackmail. So that was the event that happened. And then the second attempt or second event, excuse me, the United States has to fight against these other countries and, and deal with their activity. And North Korea has essentially got this IT worker army. So to fight against that, the United States only has so much political power worldwide and can only do so much, right? So because these are North Korean citizens, this would be no different if it was a Russian citizen or a Chinese citizen. This has happened in the past with, with Russia and China as well. The U.S. is really stuck from a governmental perspective if those individuals, even if they're identified, don't travel outside the country and can be arrested for committing what would be considered crimes in our country or in Europe 
or in, you know, in areas like that where they would be. If they're not able to do that, they really have to respond or their best response is really sanctions. So it's sanctions against the government. So in this case, a lot of times the FBI is involved, other government organizations, but the Treasury Department here that essentially is the Office of Foreign Assets Control announced sanctions. So we already have a lot of sanctions against North Korea. This is just adding that on. But this is essentially against four specific entities and one individual that they've identified. They're essentially this, this illicit IT worker army. A lot of countries, you know, obviously do not officially admit that their governments like the FSB, which is the Russian CIA, FBI organization kind of thing, they don't admit, obviously, because it would be bad politically for them to do so, that they are supporting these groups. And so a lot of these groups happen like this, where we discover that it's a group being financed and the United States or someone has enough attribution to prove that that's the case, but they can't turn around and arrest anybody and they can't do much besides sanction them. And then the third one is actually a write-up I did last week. There is a tool that's actually used by the security community in something called red teaming. It would be penetration testing if you've heard that word before. Uh, red teaming is more of an advanced level of penetration testing, usually a lot more involved. Uh, there's a um, commercial tool out there named Cobalt Strike that's been used for years. That's a tool that you can use with permission to that you license that does a lot of it has a lot of um, other tools inside of it. So essentially, it's a tool set, a Swiss Army knife of capabilities to prove that um, multi-factor didn't work properly, or that we we're able to get into this system by guessing passwords because the passwords were admin, admin, that kind of thing. Well, that tool has been used and is so popular. Um, it's been cracked and the code has been exposed out there. And someone who has rewritten this gentleman, it was, uh, I believe, at the at in this news story specifically, it was an unnamed Chinese programmer, essentially rewrote this in another language called Go and released it under the name Geekon. And that is what he calls the tool. And there is a kind of free open community version out there. And then there is a private repo that the assumption by Sentinel One, the company that did this research and discovered this tool, is essentially that there's a paid version out there that he is selling that is being used to attack other company or attack organizations worldwide. They're seeing an uptick in activity and specifically in this case, they're seeing Mac, Mac OS being affected. So that would be um, iMacs, you know, laptops, that type of thing. So that's essentially the what. And then so what? Why do we care? So I'm sure I've already covered some of this, but in the first example, that's a perfect example of insider threat. So from that company, you have an IT employee with advanced rights, probably admin access to a lot of things, faking a security incident to then extort his own company. So this is useful for security awareness training in general, all the way up to executive discussions on how they would handle this. So this is a good, there, there's things called tabletops where you kind of have a fake incident that you prepare ahead of time. This would be perfect for a tabletop situation that we've done for customers for um, insider threat and security awareness. The second one, uh, North Korea is a threat and continues to threaten organizations worldwide in general. But this is another one where they're attempting to gather illicit or illegal funds and steal. And so this is kind of the way to impact this. And why do we care? Because the only good way to affect North Korea's behavior in any way, shape, or form is to turn around and provide government level sanctions to them to attempt to protect and prepare organizations on our side, you know, on the United States side from, from harm. And then the third one is important because that was the, you know, the maturity of a, a, a tool, a new tool, a new version of a tool that's out there. This is threat groups that are using this. This uptick of activity from this report is aware, good to be aware of because um, we use and we have our customers use, you know, Mac OS systems where people are using those, um, you know, privately and potentially doing bring your own device or interacting with work systems. So you also have to think of when you look at these, not only is it crown jewels and things that the organization organization would be involved in, but that everyone that's an employee of that organization also has their own computers at home. And there's concern of, you know, what can be interacted between company systems, what can someone access on their personal machine, that type of thing. And that um, security teams, defenders essentially need to be prepared for new attacks and aware of new attacks. And then the last part, the now what? So essentially that is, you know, what happened? Why do we care? And then what do we do about it? So in my impression, what I would do with those three things is for the first story, again, this is a perfect example of insider threat, phishing, security awareness. So that is the type of thing I would share in our monthly CTI briefings with our customers, discussing the application of this event to security awareness, 
this is a specific example again for something like if they were interested in us doing a red team or a, a red team or purple team or tabletop activity that type of thing for people going forward and discussing how they could use that information and use that for awareness and protection on the second one this is essentially needs more research to look at those things i need to go out and read i have not yet read through the specific sanction information to see what you know tactical threat intelligence is in there not only the strategic level but if there's any tactical information, any new techniques and things like that, we need to be aware of and then decide, you know, was this a monthly update? Would this require some faster notification in, in, in a CTI notification or a flash brief and things that need to be shared in an immediate point? And then number three, because I did this already, essentially did what I thought in number two was I researched the details from the reporting organization and went through their technical report and I created and disseminated a CTI notification to our customers and publicly through our um, social media accounts.